me turn now to Dr. Navarro for what I think is an important part of the discussion. She's done a lot of work about this. How do we actually estimate patients' risk for cardiovascular events? Certainly, there's some things to do, as Dr. Cannon mentioned, on a community level that just apply to everyone. But in terms of individualizing risk assessments, how do we figure out who's at risk for cardiovascular disease? Thanks, Dr. Bott. Yeah, thinking about the, the last question, asking about the payers, um, it's important to note, I think, when we're thinking about why risk assessment is so important, in that almost every single clinical trial that has looked at the efficacy of lipid-lowering therapies to prevent new cardiovascular disease or reduce recurrent events in those who have disease have found that there's no benefit difference on the relative scale for any particular subgroup of patients. So everybody gets the same proportional reduction in their cardiovascular risk from therapies like statins, PCSK9, ezetimibe. The difference though is that the absolute benefit then is gonna be completely driven by what somebody's absolute predicted risk of events is going to be. So if we're thinking about how to maximize the cost effectiveness at a population level, we really wanna be targeting particularly the expensive therapies to those who have the highest absolute risk at baseline because those are gonna drive the highest absolute benefit. So the latest cholesterol guidelines did a really nice job at um, highlighting what are the ways that we can identify the highest risk group. So in primary prevention, we're very accustomed to using the pooled cohort equations to start our risk assessment in patients. So people who don't have cardiovascular disease, um, very well validated equations that can be used that use a combination of age, sex, race, blood pressure, diabetes status, smoking status um, to, to generate a baseline risk. But not every factor that increases a patient's risk made it into that model for uh, reasons that sort of go beyond the context of this conversation. But there are other really important high-risk groups that the new guidelines remind us to think about. Those include people with family history of early heart disease, chronic kidney disease, metabolic syndrome, um, women-specific conditions like preeclampsia in pregnancy or premature women, menopause, uh, inflammatory diseases, so uh, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, HIV, and certain ethnic groups like South Asian ancestry. They also remind us to think about that the duration of exposure to risk factors is important. So people who have persistently elevated cholesterol levels or particularly high cholesterol levels are also at risk. And then there are other biomarkers and other tests that we can use to help risk stratify. So people with high lipoprotein A levels, high ApoB levels, high sensitivity CRP, and in the recent guidelines using CAC scoring to identify people with um, preclinical or subclinical atherosclerosis. So that in the primary prevention space is how we think about identifying the highest risk groups. Now in secondary prevention, we used to paint everybody with the same brush and say, if you have cardiovascular disease, you're at high risk. Well, we know that that's not the case and that some patients with cardiovascular disease are at higher risk than others. And this is particularly important as the guideline authors mentioned, when, it think, when we start thinking about who are we gonna treat with therapies that can potentially be budget busters, like the PCSK9 inhibitors. So the guidelines encourage us to look for the highest risk patients in secondary prevention as well. And those risk enhancers or those very high risk groups are sort of similar with some notable exceptions. So people with recent acute coronary syndrome, people who've had multiple events, those who have had um, uh, vascular events in different territories, so PAD and coronary disease or PAD and cerebrovascular disease indicating more diffuse atherosclerotic burden. And then other high-risk conditions like familial hypercholesterolemia, again, looking back to cumulative exposure to high LDL, those with diabetes, hypertension, CKD, smoking, or CHF. These are groups of uh, patients that have extremely high risk of recurrent events and are recommended for the most aggressive lipid-lowering therapies. Well, that's really a very great and comprehensive answer. You know, I think times have changed in many respects. Secondary prevention, I was just thinking as you were saying about the value of risk scores there. I was involved with the REACH Registry risk score. It was developed in part for secondary prevention. It was, you know, great folks involved, some of the folks involved with the Framingham risk score. 
were involved. It was uh, well thought out, but uh, the initial journals we submitted it to it really um, it had a hard time in, in editorial and peer review where the comment was great score, nice statistics, uh, wonderful, but who needs a risk score in secondary prevention? I mean, all these patients are gonna get the same stuff. And I think the point you made is really good when we are considering advanced therapies, therapies that might be expensive, therapies that might have side effects, it really does help to further risk stratify. I also thought it was good that you mentioned some of the novel sorts of things to think about in terms of risk factors, whether it's biomarkers such as CRP or LP little a, uh, CAC potentially in, in, in its role in risk stratification potentially, and even risk factors that are sex or race ethnicity specific that we've learned a lot about in the past few years. So that, that was really a very comprehensive type of review.